Okay, so welcome everyone and good afternoon, good morning, good evening from wherever you're joining us. Um, my name is Evangeline Arswala and I'm the Alumni Engagement Officer with the CSE Alumni Team. And uh, today we are hosting the webinar, the CSE Development in Action webinar on the topic, the viability of mandatory rehabilitation in Jamaican prisons. Quite an interesting topic, I must say. And today's webinar will be delivered by Commonwealth alumnus Dr. Dr. Leslie, whom you can all see on your screen. Um, Dr. Leslie, or Dr. Dacia, as I may say, uh, is a 2011 Commonwealth Scholar from Jamaica and has completed her PhD in Criminology at Cardiff University. Um, brief introduction about Dacia. Um, Dr. Leslie is a research fellow and chair of the, of the Crime Prevention and Offender Management Research uh, Cluster hosted by the Sir Arthur Lewis Institute of Social and Economic Studies at the University of West Indies, Mona Campus. She's a Canada CARICOM Scholar and Research Associate um, of the Institute of Island Studies. University of Edward Island. I'm also pleased to inform you that Dr. Leslie is the winner of 2021 Taylor and Francis CSE Research Output Stream, which was a part of the CSE's Research Impact Awards. Um, and you can find more information on this on the CSE website. Um, and in this webinar, Dr. Dacha will share information about this uh, about winning this award and also about her career as a criminologist in uh, the Caribbean region. So um, looking forward to this webinar presentation and without any further delay, I would like to invite Dr. Dacha to present her topic. Thank you, Ava, for that kind introduction. Welcome, everyone. Um, let me first start by saying many thanks to the Commonwealth Scholarship Commission for this opportunity to share with current scholars and alumni some initial thoughts regarding the viability of mandatory rehabilitation within the small island developing state context of Jamaica. Of course, this topic forms part of the larger body of work advanced by the Commonwealth Scholarship, which as you heard from Ava, I received in 2011. Um, where I pursued a PhD in criminology at Cardiff University. And so today's presentation can be linked to at least two of the commission's themes, but the theme that we will focus on today is strengthening global peace, security, and governance, which is but one of the six themes of the commission. And this theme aligns with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal 16, which speaks to promoting peaceful, just, and inclusive society through strong institutions. I must also say that, um, you know, I'm really grateful for the grant which I received. Today's presentation forms part of the, the Developing Action webinar series um, in an effort to showcase ongoing research and action supported by the Research Impact Awards um, Research Output Stream, which I won in 2021, as you would have heard. And for those persons who are not aware, each year the, the commission partners with Taylor and Francis to celebrate the research and publication endeavors of Commonwealth scholars and an alumni at the early and mid-career research stages. So congratulations to the 22, 2022 winners, and I encourage all early and mid-career scholars to get involved. So today I will share with you briefly the rationale for this current study, which is ongoing and which represents an offshoot of fieldwork I completed during the PhD. I will start the presentation with an overview of Jamaica and highlight some key sociodemographic characteristics of the custodial population. Following this, I will share some key ideas regarding how rehabilitation is defined and implemented in a Jamaican context. Um, this is before I introduce some of the um, 
theoretical debates surrounding mandatory rehabilitation. Next, I will go into the discussion regarding preliminary impressions about the viability of mandatory rehabilitation, largely drawing on the research findings from the recidivism in the Caribbean book publication, which was anchored in a largely qualitative methodological design, which I will briefly describe whilst highlighting some fieldwork challenges. I will then conclude and provide some general recommendations. And then the presentation will end with a brief reflection on the research and development impact potential of this current body of work advanced by the Commonwealth Scholarship. So today, um, you know, we're looking at mandatory rehabilitation. Um, and this is the result of you know, curiosity to undertake a more in-depth investigation into the topic. And this was triggered by the Jamaican online newspaper Gleaner article, which you can see on screen dated Thursday, March 31st, 2022. Um, and, it, and you can see that it's entitled Prisoners to be Forced into Rehab Programs. From the interview with the state minister with responsibility for correctional services, Gleaner writer Carl Gilchrist notes a number of things, including that following the review of the Corrections Act, participation in rehabilitation programs will no longer be optional given the high non-participation rate in rehabilitation interventions. So the question now becomes to what extent is this decision to make rehabilitation programs mandatory feasible and to what extent is such a policy decision implementable, right? So before we delve into the feasibility of the decision to implement mandatory rehabilitation, I would like to share with you a little bit about Jamaica and its custodial population. So Jamaica is an island situated in the Caribbean Sea. It spans about 4,244 square miles in area and is about 90 miles south of Cuba, 119 miles west of Hispaniola, the island containing the countries of Haiti and the Dominican Republic. It is the third most populous Anglophone Caribbean in the Americas with a population size of roughly 2.8 million. Its employment rate is fairly high. The murder rate is extremely high, where 48 in every 100,000 persons are murdered with a prison population rate of 130 per 100,000 population. There are under 4,000 persons in the custody of the Department of Correctional Services, the government department responsible for clients in their care. And so the national estimates of recidivism or repeat offending are based on the correctional services measures of readmission to a correctional center and the previous con conviction based on a non-custodial sentence. Therefore, if we draw on the readmission measure, then the estimate rate of recidivism is 28% and 41% when we combine both measures. Jamaica's remand population, as you can see in the table of 37%, guys is the reality that 52% of children in correctional centers for children are on remand. Again, flagging the need to give greater attention to this vulnerable population. In terms of governance, the Department of Correctional Services Jamaica has responsibility for the management of all, all 11 correctional institutions, seven of which house adult inmates. Um, and of course, this is sort of a state obligation which entails the duty of care. And in the care of the DCS, we have about 2,772 inmates, including 43 foreign national offenders, 893 persons on remand, and 201 children. So continuing with the overview of the custodial population, so you get a better understanding of the context. Figure one shows that when compared to St. Kitts and Nevis, Trinidad and Tobago, 
Jamaica's prison population rate is low at 130 per 100,000, although the murder rate stands at 43.9. In St. Kitts and Nevis, for example, the prison population rate is much higher at 423 with a fairly high murder rate as well. You will also see in figure one that based on Jamaica's occupancy level for all of its 11 correctional facilities together, Jamaica's correctional facilities are not overcrowded. Of course, this is only if prison overcrowding is defined as spatial density. However, one maxi maximum security facility, Tower Street, continues to op operate above capacity at approximately 195%. So I will now share with you some ideas about what constitutes rehabilitation in general terms. In general terms, rehabilitation is difficult to pin down such that when different writers, theorists, or practitioners refer to the concept, it is often the case that they're not talking about the same thing. It is generally referred to, however, an objective of the prison sentence, sometimes a goal, a process, or a set of practices. There is, however, some level of agreement within the literature to suggest that rehabilitation is a process that involves helping inmates or prisoners experience positive behavioral change, usually in keeping with mainstream norms and values. In terms of prison-based rehabilitation, some precedence is set by international law and particularly Article 10, 10.3 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which Jamaica ratified in 1975. It states, and I quote, the penitentiary system shall comprise treatment of prisoners, the essential aim of which shall be their reformation and social rehabilitation. So a rights-based approach to rehabilitation therefore requires that persons deprived of liberty have job training, educational, counseling, psych psychological care opportunities that can assist with their effective reintegration upon release with a view to preventing their recidivism or reoffending. This approach is based on the notion that offenders have a right not to be unduly disadvantaged by the experience of punishment and particularly imprisonment as much as the state has a right to punish wrongdo wrongdoing, right? So as a result, rehabilitative measures must be put in place to prevent undue disadvantage by the experience of imprisonment. Rehabilitation thought and practice has evolved over the years and you will see the trajectory um, projected on screen. Um, it now centers on an understanding of what works in promoting the assistance of offenders. This of course was stimulated by the What, what Works movement which emerged, emerged in the 1990s to reassert the effectiveness of mainly cognitive behavioral treatment programs in reducing recidivism. However, there is also a shift taking place towards strengths-based approaches that view offenders as active participants in the rehabilitation process. We also see in the Jamaican context that during the COVID-19 pandemic, e-rehabilitation um, was on the rise and has gained popularity. Continuing with how rehabilitation is implemented in Jamaican context, it is a mission of the Department of Correctional Services to secure, supervise, rehabilitate, reintegrate offenders as productive and law-abiding citizens. Um, rehabilitation interventions then include academic and vocational training, drug treatment, psychotherapy, creative art therapies, work release, home leave, rehabilitation grant to support the startup to support startup businesses of newly re released persons, recreation activities, um, including sports, mentorship, craftsmanship, spiritual renewal, 
music production and opportunities to become an orderly or in other words, obtain work opportunities inside the facilities. A number of NGOs are involved in the administration of these interventions, including Stand Up Jamaica, Sandals Foundation, Food for the Poor. The YouTube clip, which I'm about to play, you will see how music production as a rehabilitation intervention has been implemented inside the facilities. It shows Jamaican artist Jack Cure performing Reflection, a song which is said to have been written while he was behind bars in Jamaica. Listen carefully to the words of Jack Cure and how he talks about the importance of agency in his experience of rehabilitation. Awesome. So that was you heard just now from Jack Cure. Um, and sorry. right, so you just heard from Jack Cure and you heard the song reflection of him um, creating this song whilst in prison as part of a rehabilitation exercise. So when we start to have discussions around making rehabilitation mandatory, 
we are making a number of assumptions which might not hold true in all scenarios, right? We're assuming that the causes of deviance are discoverable and open for treatment, which is not always the case. Mandatory prison-based rehabilitation also assumes that if offenders are not incapacitated, then treatment becomes difficult. And if they're not treat treated, they will get worse. But there are alternatives to imprisonment that can be explored, especially when it involves minor offenders. The rationale for mandatory rehabilitation is also that treatment, if coerced, is not punitive and it is for the offenders good and the good of society in general. And we can understand that in the case of Jamaica that has such a high crime rate, but it can also violate fundamental rights, including the right to treat, to treat persons with respect, um, you know, to ensure that we recognize their inherent dignity and value as human beings and their right to be treated according to their needs without discrimination. And of course, this is clearly stipulated in the revised Nelson Mandela rules or um, otherwise known as the UN standard minim minimum rules for the treatment of prisoners. It is also known that the underlying causes of crime have not shown themselves to be especially amenable to manipulation. And so the larger emphasis should be on manipulating the circumstances in which offending takes place. The commonality between all of these assumptions is that they overlook the ability of offenders to make decisions and choices. This is problematic in a number of respects, as we shall see later in the presentation. So given what you have heard in terms of how rehabilitation is defined, justified, um, and implemented in the Jamaican context, I would like for you to take the next two minutes to reflect on whether you would want rehabilitation in your country to also be mandatory. So I'm going to give you the next two minutes to just reflect on whether or not you would want rehabilitation in your country to be mandatory. So we see persons, majority saying yes, mandatory rehabilitation, right? Only 6% so far saying no, and 17% maybe. All right, I'm just going to give persons another few minutes to, or 40, 48 seconds to just indicate their response. Right, wow. Wow. So the, the overwhelming majority are saying that, you know, um, mandate that rehabilitation in their country should be made mandatory. Thank you so much for sharing. I hope as we go into some of the prelim preliminary findings, we will also be able to revisit the just some of these justifications that you have in mind when um, suggesting that it should be made mandatory. Okay, and there are the results. We're going to just move on now to the next slide. So for the purposes of this inquiry, I reanalyzed re the qualitative data set from the original study from the PhD in seeking to gain insights into the viability of mandatory rehabilitation in the Jamaican context. In the earlier work, I drew on a combination of purposive and snowball sampling techniques. 73 semi-structured interviews were conducted with ex-offenders, 55 um, adults deprived of liberty and inside the facilities, and 18 living within the community. 17 service providers were also interviewed, three inside the correctional system and 14 operating within the community. This data was triangulated with six focus groups, four conducted inside the facility and two within the community. All participants 
provided informed consent for the interviews to be conducted and for the focus groups to be, both the interviews and focus groups to be recorded. Recordings were transcribed and analyzed thematically and adaptive theory used to make sense of the data. Majority of persons interviewed inside the facility were serving a sentence for robbery. They were 36 to 40 years of age and were also serving a second um, custodial sentence. Currently, majority of persons are admitted into the adult correctional facilities for illegal possession of firearm and ammunition. When we dissect it by gender, we see that women are now being admitted mainly for murder, manslaughter, or attempted murder instead of traditionally violations of the Dangerous Drugs Act. One key one fieldwork challenge I encountered included engage, in gaining access to this um, population, gaining access into the correctional facilities. This was overcome by drawing on existing networks, including Commonwealth alumni who were able to help negotiate access after following the regular procedures of submitting an ethics proposal to the Ministry of National Security for review and approval. And I talk about, I talk more about these challenging challenges in much more detail in the SAGE research method case study published in 2021. You will hear more about this later in, in the presentation. So in reviewing the evidence, the importance of individual agency came out strongly, painting current understandings of rehabilitation as overly deterministic and overly focused on the manipulation of circumstances in which offending takes place instead of the ability of in, in individuals to make decisions. However, in majority of cases, the participants interviewed felt that self-rehabilitation was necessary before any other form of intervention could be considered meaningful to them. So here we see Frank, who was now living in the community but had several experiences of returning to prison, explaining that intrinsic to the rehabilitative process is a willingness on the part of inmates to use the opportunity of being locked away in a controlled environment to reflect on the quality of their lives, think about how they're going to change and utilize the available resources to make that change. The importance of agency was also highlighted in Jason's interview. Jason, who was a career gun for hire or hitman prior to being re-imprisoned explains that without him looking within himself, to see where he went from. In the absence of this inward introspection, then he is suggesting that no form of rehabilitation intervention can help him. So the study identified a number of difficulties with enforcing mandatory rehabilitation, all of which can be linked to the need for capacity development. This included, you know, inconsistent use of risk needs assessment. Um, there was a lack of evidence-based programming. So uh, you did not find that there was um, traditional monitoring and evaluation of existing interventions or rehabilitation interventions. There was also inefficient use of existing rehabilitation resources and persons interview spoke about, you know, you know, a revolving cycle taking place in terms of which programs you are able to participate in. So some persons would be able to take the same program each year over and over with no monitoring as to how this program is helping to, you know, foster their positive behavioral change. And so there was a tendency to be drawn to, you know, um, initiatives or interventions that were, IT focus. So persons were very interested in getting involved in the, the computer program for a number of reasons, including that sometimes, you know, they, the system would have been breached and they can make contact 
on the outside. So these are a number of issues. There, there, there is also an issue with specialized staff shortages. So when you think about a population of 4,000, and when you add staff to that, they probably have only probably two psychologists employed to, to address the needs of this population of 4,000 and staff uh, would add to that figure. So again, the lack of monitoring, um, the Auditor General in one of its latest reports found that not all persons admitted into the care of the correctional service underwent risk needs assessment. It therefore means that participation in rehabilitation programs are not always targeted to addressing the needs of um, inmates. And then of course there is there are issues of contraband entering the facility and um, I leave it there. So I'm suggesting that these are some of the capacity issues we must first seek to address before initiating a conversation around mandatory rehabilitation. So overall, the findings from the initial study suggest that while it is concerning that only about 50% of inmates participate in various rehabilitation programs, that seek to improve their, the likelihood that they will lead productive and crime-free free lives in the community after completing their sentences. There is another question that needs to be asked in keeping with the rights-based approach to rehabilitation. Will mandatory rehabilitation prevent undue disadvantage by the experience of imprisonment? Uh, the evidence from recidivism in the Caribbean which was published by Palgrave Macmillan, suggests that it might, since some things work for some offenders in some circumstances. But what is clear is that the Department of Correctional Services does not currently have the administrative capacity to effectively enforce mandatory rehabilitation, given the inconsistent use of risk needs assessment, lack of evidence-based programming, inefficient use of existing rehabilitation resources, lack of specialized staff shortages, lack of monitoring, and prison corruption. So my recommendation will be that um, before we move towards implementing mandatory rehabilitation, we must first build cap develop capacity. In support of this objective, there are a number of resources that we can draw on. The United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime has developed a roadmap for the development of prison-based rehabilitation programs. It provides practical guidance to assist correctional services around the world to develop high quality and sustainable rehabilitation programs that meet international standards. I would even go further to say that lessons learned from rehabilitation programs that work such as a new path, promoting a healthy environment and productive alternatives for juvenile remandes and offenders in Jamaica need to be implemented. Amongst these lessons learned is the need for gender sensitive correctional practices. So a number, so talking, when, when, when I reflect on the research and development impact or the potential of um, development impact in the long term, um, I started with focusing on you know, trying to fill the knowledge gap. A number of peer review publications have come out of this initial study. Uh, this includes the SAGE, SAGE Research Methods Cases publication entitled Preserving Researcher Safety While Investigating Recidivism in a Caribbean Context. This publication in particular is pedagogical in nature and it highlights the pros and cons of undertaking field work in, uh, inside prison facilities. And it also highlights the risk of harm for participants and the researcher, but it, all, it goes further to highlight lessons learned and ways of minimizing some of these risks. It will be a useful resource for researchers or scholars interested in undertaking research in a prison environment and those looking to undertake field work in a Caribbean country context. 
of course, you know, I'm, I operate an open um, door policy. So you can feel free to send me an email and I'm more than happy to connect with prospective researchers as well as those wishing to receive further details on any of these publications. So one of the things that inspired my area of research um, even before I received the, the Commonwealth Scholarship was that criminology is an underserved area in the Caribbean region. And of course, when you start talking about female criminologists, we are few and far between, right? So I'm one of the few persons looking to study uh, um, study about crime and you know finding so sustainable solutions to addressing this issue that affects um, Caribbean countries, not just Caribbean countries, but a number of countries across Latin America and the Caribbean region. So based on the need for more expertise in the area, um, upon returning home from the UK, I you know, established the Salises Crime Prevention and Offender Management Research Cluster in 2017. The cluster consists of academics and practitioners working on finding effective ways of preventing crime and recidivism, enforcing the law, and promoting criminal justice reform through research and collaboration. Some of the, the objectives of the cluster include you know, forming strategic partnerships to encourage active collaboration towards achieving SDG 16 and to ensure the wider impact of the cluster's research initiatives. So on the, on the slide, you will see um, a public forum we had to raise awareness about how prison systems across the Caribbean region were faring during the COVID-19 pandemic. And it was um, a well-attended um, discussion where, you know, you, you would see superintendents from across the region on the panel and the then Minister of State responsible for correctional services being the keynote speaker in that event. Um, there was collaboration with the U University of Prince Edward Island, um, at least four um, correctional services across the Caribbean region, um, yeah, and, and representation from the UN. So these are some of the ways in which, you know, this work is developing and moving towards supporting inclusive, sustainable development. Now, in the second artifact, you would see um, that a workshop was held um, entitled Navigating Common PhD Challenges. Now, interestingly, in seeking to try to address this um, knowledge gap and limited expertise in the Caribbean region, I've taken on a number of research students doing research in the area. So this workshop was held to kind of help those who are doing the MPhil PhD in the area to understand some of the common challenges that scholars face in general when they were doing their PhD and to you know, kind of you know, empower them with some tools that they can use to navigate some of these challenges. Now, since the crime prevention or offender management research cluster has been created, we have you know, kind of hosted a number of public um, fora. We have done a number of training sessions to facilitate um, this kind of development. Um, and then the last artifact is, uh, you know, also an output of the cluster. We were invited to participate in a consultancy um, where we are asked to, to, to develop an integrated strategic plan, which was a key output of the first witness care conference to be held in Jamaica on July 19 to 20 in 2019. And the, following that, we organized a witness care strategic planning e-workshop held on June 9, 2020. Both events were organized by Salesis, um, and this project was commissioned by the Justice Undertakings for Social Transformation Project Global Affairs Canada with the support of the United Nations Development Program. Both the Integrated Strategic Plan 
and a protocol for strengthening multi-agency interaction with um, Jamaica's child justice system were handed over to the Honorable Delroy Chuck, Minister of Justice on October 28, 2020. Um, you know, in seeking to support um, up, uptake of the, the strategic plan, um, 200 physical copies were distributed all across Jamaica. And so there is a follow-up phase to this project where we are now looking to support the implementation of the strategic plan. So here are some references for those persons interested in um, doing research in the area. These resources are particularly useful and I can share with you a more comprehensive listing um, when you send me an email or let me know um, what sort of follow-up you would like us to have. Yes. And with that said, thank you for listening. I now look forward to hear, receiving your questions. Over to you, Ava. Thank you so much, Tatia. That was a brilliant presentation. And so the um, our attendees today would echo the same thoughts. Um, so we do have a couple of questions that we have received in advance uh, by the registration forms. And um, if the attendees have any questions, please feel free to send them via the chat box and we will uh, raise them during uh, the Q&A session now. Um, so Dacia, if you're ready, I would like to um, raise one of the questions um, that we received in advance. And the question is, um, has there been has there been an impact assessment or evaluation to ascertain the level of reintegration impact on the individuals and in the state? Thank you so much for that question. Um, so one of the things I, I made mention of in the pre preliminary research findings is that there is a lack of evidence-based programming. What that means is there, there hasn't been any form of um, impact assessment undertaken in terms of the, you know, the extent to which re reintegration or effective reintegration is taking place. Um, fortunately, I had the privilege of being a part of a consultancy looking at the, or we undertook an outcome evaluation of a, the new, a new path project, which involved, you know, supporting a number of children in the justice system reintegrate into society by introducing a number of reintegration interventions. And that, and that program was highly successful, but of course it wasn't an impact assessment. Um, impact would be, you know, following up with them probably, you know, next year or so to see where they are now, right? Um, and with that said, it would be nice for us to get resources to do some longitudinal studies rather than one-off interviews. But no, there is no impact assessment being done. And this, this is one of the things that we need to be doing um, so we know what is working, what is not working, so we can make the necessary adjustments. So thank you for that question. Definitely. And if we have any uh, comments, scholars or alumni who are um, you know, attending this live session, um, especially from the Caribbean region, working in this sector, do feel free to get in touch with Batya and we will take this uh, discussion further. Thank you for your response, Dacia. The next question is, um, are there specific strategies to tackle the challenges facing the prison administration in regards to rehabilitation? Are there, sorry, can you repeat? Are there specific strategies to tackle the challenges facing the, re, uh, facing the prison administration in regards to rehabilitation? Okay, yes, well, um, there are a number of things that are being are underway or in the pipeline. I think over the years, this has been the case because the problem has been recognized over the years, including the fact that the infrastructure itself where persons are, um, are being detained, it's not suitable or conducive to rehabilitation. So 
there would have been talks about building new facilities and talks about locating land. So there are a number of strategies in the pipeline. I myself, I'm currently uh, serving on a board, um, a Bureau of Standards for Jamaica Technical Correctional Service Board, where we are looking to develop um, correctional standards across the board to ensure that you know there are the minimum there are minimum standards for how we treat with um, you know inmates or persons deprived of deprived of liberty in Jamaica. So there are a number of things underway, and the Ministry of National Security has in the pipeline a policy, a correctional policy that is now being developed. I had the the privilege of commenting on the document, which is not yet public. Um, and so making suggestions as, as to how it can be improved. The difficulty is now is to get the policy now from, from off the page and you, you know to getting it actually implemented in practice. But there are a number of brilliant plans and things in the pipeline. Um, and over the years, adjustments have been made because the Jamaican case, when we had the panel discussion, the Jamaican case was stood out in terms of how long they were able to um, prevent COVID from getting inside the facilities. I think they were able to to um, prevent, you know, um, the spread up to six months um, since it came to the shores of Jamaica. So there are no more things in place, um, but one of the challenges that we continue to face is the implementation deficit. And it's not always the case that it's a lack of financial resources. There are sometimes, you know, if we look into how we manage things, we can make those improvements. Perfect. Thank you so much. So moving to the next question, and if I'm not audible, um, I am taking questions from the chat box now. So you can, uh, you know, if you can have a look at the questions there as well. But if you cannot hear me, please let me know. Um, the next question is uh, by Dorothy, who has asked, um, you did say that the recidivism rate is 28%. Um, and they're wondering if there are there's any statistics specific for young offenders and what offenses are young offenders mainly charged with? Okay, so this recidivism rate would only include adults, mainly because in the Jamaican context, um, they do not track the what we would call the recidivism of young persons. Um, persons admitted to the adult cor correctional services would usually be 18 years and above, right? Um, which in Jamaica, you at 18, you are now an adult. Um, so if it is that there are per, there are children inside the facility and they need to be transferred to the adult, they would not be transferred until they achieve age 18. Now, one of the reasons that the youth recidivism is not really tracked is uh, technically um, we don't consider children as um, having criminal records, but I can tell you some work was done. The same study I made mention of where we looked at how effective the A New Pass program is. There was some attempt to try to, you know, say if we were to put a rate on this group of children, this is what it would look like. So for, for the person asking that question, I, I'm more than happy to share that report with you. Um, if you just send me an email, but generally in Jamaica, we don't, um, we don't track or we don't monitor youth recidivism. Thank you, Dacia. Um, so the next question is around, um, uh, you know, uh, people who have been uh, in prison on false accusations, for example. So the question is, uh, the the person who's asked the question has um, has indicated that he spoke about 48 in every 1,000 people associated with murder. Um, and they would like to know that if there are any uh, false cases uh, due to any misunderstandings, then how do the victims undergo rehabilitation process? And this has been a question that has also been asked in the uh, registration form as well. 
That's a very excellent question. I'm happy that person is listening to the presentation. Right, so what you're referring to is a miscarriage of justice where persons who um, somehow, for some reason, um, they get their, it, it might not be that they're innocent, but it could be that they're left in prison awaiting trial for a number of years. And a number of cases have come up in, in recent times. So they're imprisoned at the, the governor general's pleasure awaiting trial and then 15 years down the line you found you have heard that a person died without receiving a trial um in that case in that scenario technically if we are to accept the theoretical definition of rehabilitation which is that you did the wrong and you are receiving treatment or some form of exposure to some form of intervention to change your behavior. In the theoretical sense, it wouldn't apply because technically you did not do the wrong. At least um, we, we have not gone through the proper due process to determine that you are guilty or innocent. But assuming that the person is actually innocent, um, the rehabilitation in the sense of treatment would not apply, but rehabilitation in the sense of a rights-based approach and, and rehabilitation that sees it as a subcomponent of a broader behavioral reintegration process. So now you have been in the facility for 10 years without trial and somehow some lawyer, some human rights lawyer discover the case and you are, you know, released. Upon release, you're going to need some intervention. You're going to need counseling because now you've been outside of society for a long time. The question is, do are there provisions for those persons? Well, it's not so clear cut, but I know that DCS would, you know, somehow source counseling for those persons, but it's not something that you would see built into the correctional policy that persons who, um, you know, are victims of a miscarriage of justice should, should as a matter of, um, you know, it, it should be compulsory that they receive counseling upon release. Um, so I would say that rehabilitation would still apply in the sense that they need help to reintegrate into community after leaving that community. And things would, you know, a lot of things change, even just the type of telephone that person might not know, know about, you know, iPhone and all of these things. So those everyday things. So even though they might have been innocent, they would still need some intervention to find employment now because how do you explain the gap in your employment history, right? So these are some of the ways in which rehabilitation, not in a medical sense, would apply. So this is rehabilitation or um, reintegration in an administrative sense. That was really a very informative dossier, really interesting uh, information to have. Um, all right, so the next question is, uh, before the question, um, acknowledgement, a uh, brilliant and wonderful presentation. Um, and the question is that um, the study shows that there is high murder cases, mostly committed by men. Um, do you have any data on why, what is the reason that, you know, there's only men or, or the high cases are only around men? Uh, and um, the person who's asking the question who also said that oh, I have also seen that unemployment rate is not that high. So what could be the reason for this kind of high rate of crime? Okay, so <clears throat> when we say not that high or high, it's we use a benchmark. So unemployment rate for us in Jamaica here when compared to other Caribbean countries, it's, it's, we consider it high, right? Um, in terms of um, majority of major crimes being committed by men, um, the, the 
the, the reasons for that, we can talk about structural inequalities. We can talk about a number of things related to gender inequality. Um, but there are a number of studies out there that talks about, you know, that points to gang, gang warfare and gang membership and the likelihood of recruits being males, um, but also the Don culture in Jamaica, um, mm -hmm. which in a way you will find that men feature mostly in that, in, in that kind of cul culture, although that is slightly changing. But there are a number of factors we can use to explain why the majority of persons inside the facilities are men. And I'll, again, link it to um gender considerations which if you would like me to share with you some research on this subject i can if you send me an email i definitely but the, the, the you can't link you can't tie it down to any one factor there are intersectionalities in everything that we speak of even the the type of crime for which men are admitted for there are a number of different considerations so it's a bit broad brush for me to just, you know, throw. But off the top of my head, you know that um, gang gang warfare, gang membership in Jamaica is um, something that, you know, features heavily in the research literature. Um, the gang violence here, but linked to um, the, the community, troubled communities, or what we call garrison communities which has you know garrison communities have their political antecedents so a number of reasons that we can think about um in relation to the number of men in prison as opposed to women right this is a I welcome any conversation any side conversations following this um webinar perfect um i did realize since we're not on the the slides with your contact details what i'm going to do is i'm going to um i'm going to add the linkedin profile link uh to dr Tatia in the chat box um and dr Tatia, if when you have a moment uh if you don't mind um adding your email address uh so attendees can get in touch with you uh, yeah via absolutely um, while I scroll up again in the chat box for questions for you. Um, okay, so when you're ready, I am ready with the next question for you. Yeah, I'm ready. <laughs> Great. Um, so the next question is uh, from an attendee whose uh, background is actually in, uh, in medicine. Um, so the question is that uh, they haven't looked into the types of chronic medical conditions that our prisoners are dealing with. Um, so they're asking if you have ever looked into conditions such as HIV AIDS and do prisoners have any facilities for rehabilitation? Okay, so thank you so much for that question. Yes, in fact, my, my research is currently looking at especially the um, treatment of um, inmates with mental disabilities um, in terms of the estimates as to how many or what proportion of the population um, can be confirmed as having HIV AIDS. I think the last estimate was about 3%. Um, one of the strategies implemented to prevent the further spread within within the facility itself was to um, separate persons um, on, well, ac actually, there is a form of classification that is being implemented to separate persons from the general population. Now, this has its advantages and its disadvantages, right? because the separation now means that the this group of individuals are stigmatized. And so when they're released within the, the wider population, um, it can be the source of you know, violence or their, vic their, victim their victimization, violent victimization. Um, so they're separated for their own protection, but at the same time, they're not able to move freely 
to attend, for example, classes, right? So there are disadvantages and, dis and advantages with this separation. Um, yeah, it's certainly an area that I want to delve further in um, from a medic soci sociological medical perspective. But yes, absolutely, my study does look at some of these considerations. And I currently sit on the board of Stand Up Jamaica. They have done um, in-depth research on this population um, to kind of see ways in which uh, this, this, the human rights of this group of individuals are being violated. I can share that report with you as well. It's available online. Amazing, that would be great. And uh, we do not have any further questions, but one final note before uh, we end this Q&A session is uh, from a fellow Jamaican, uh, Joel, who's, um, who's asked to convey their appreciation for your great presentation. And, and contributions as well. So um, the comment is that Jamaica has had tremendous success with intersector and interdisciplinary collaboration to address COVID-19, uh, all sectors on board, that is. Um, this approach could be used towards improving rehabilitation. A broader stakeholder might be the best option when correctional service resources are limited. So, um, there you go. That was the final note. And with that, I would like to come to an end of the Q&A session. Um, brilliant questions coming to you from our attendees. Thank you so much for, for sending your questions. Um, and yes, uh, you can um, have a quick look at Dr.'s contact details in the chat box. Uh, but yeah, just to finally summarize this webinar, Dr.'s any final words? Yes, definitely. Um, I just want to encourage everyone to, you know, continue to do the work that you're doing. You're Commonwealth scholars because you're, you have been identified as trailblazers, but change makers. And I know that you're making your mark in different areas of the world. Um, just to encourage you to remember to apply for the Impact Awards because you know, there is impact in everything that you're doing. And I just want to thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedules to come and listen to me talking about um, persons deprived of liberty and their rights, right? Um, thank you, Ava, so much for facilitating this. And I look forward to hearing more about the work of everyone here. Thank you, definitely. Uh, 